Right, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. So for those of you who don't know me, I, um, you may actually be slightly confused by my accent. So let me explain where that comes from. So I, I grew up in, I was actually born in London. Um, I moved to Australia when I was about seven months old. So I spent my formative years in Australia so that you can, you can uh, hear that antip antipodean accent there a little bit. I then moved back, I did my PhD in Australia and then moved back to England um, and actually lived in Cambridge for three and a half years for my postdoc at the Sanger Institute. And I've now been in Boston for around about the last four years. So I have, I have combinations of Australian, English and American and you may hear different words from each of those accents uh, pronounced throughout my talk. And my, uh, my lab in Boston, for those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar, actually do we have a pointer? That's one thing I forgot to ask. If we don't, it's fine. I can. If, if we have one, that's great, but otherwise I can just point in the general direction of things. Um, so for, the, for those of you who are not familiar with Boston geography, this is, uh, this is, is Boston. This is the mighty Charles River coming down through the, the middle of it here. On the south side of the river, you have Boston proper, Boston the city, and on the north side of the river is Cambridge. And my lab actually spends its week divided between these two different locations. So around about half the week we spend at Massachusetts General Hospital, which is the largest uh, research hospital in the, in the US. And that's great because it means we get to spend our time with an excellent set of clinical investigators. And then the other half of our week, we spend across the river at the Broad Institute of uh, MIT and Harvard. And the Broad, I suspect many of you are familiar with, is the largest genomics facility in the US. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a remarkable place to be able to spend our time because it gives us access to a huge amount of sequencing capacity. So now up to 24 uh, X10 machines pumping out uh, whole genome and, and uh, other sequencing data. Uh, in, in addition, we have access to an amazing range of expertise in uh, informatic analysis, and that's really been incredibly uh, important for pretty much all of the work that I'll be discussing today. In fact, I'd say pretty much everything that I'll, that I'll be talking about today is really a, a broad-centered project rather than an MGH-centered project. So my, my group has four basic areas of expertise, and I'll really only be talking about one of them today. So the first, which I won't touch on, um, but of course is highly relevant to some people here in the audience, is figuring out how we can use large-scale genomic data sets to improve the diagnosis of rare diseases. Um, and as, as was noted in the introduction, uh, particularly in the area of neuromuscular disease. Um, and here we're, we're very focused on the use of firstly large-scale exome sequencing, but then increasingly whole genome, and importantly RNA sequencing to improve uh, the diagnosis of, of these diseases. The, the second point that I'll spend much more time on is ways in which we can pull together very large reference data sets of sequence variation. Um, and I'll talk through a whole bunch of different ways in which those large data sets are useful for understanding the variation that we find in our, in our disease patients. And then two other points that I won't really touch on at all. Firstly, using RNA sequencing to understand the impact of genetic variation on, on gene function and disease risk, both in the general population as well as in rare disease patients. And then finally, uh, increasingly, figuring out how we can use our uh, very large databases of genetic variation to potentially understand wh whether a given gene is likely to be a useful drug target. So how, how well we can use that for therapy. And in particular, understand the, the probability that a particular gene, when inhibited, will lead to either adverse events or uh, to efficacious uh, reduction in the, in the risk of some disease. So as I mentioned today, I'll really be focusing on that second point, and that is the ways in which we can pull together very large data sets of genetic variation from more or less the general population to help us make sense of the variants that we find in patients. So the, the underlying motivation for this work, and this has really been a project that's been a central focus of the lab for around about three years now, is that in order to make sense of the variation that we find in any one person's genome, we need to be able to place that in the context of tens of thousands of other genomes, and in fact, probably hundreds of thousands of other genomes. Uh, and th this is true across a whole range of different areas of analysis uh, in, in, in human genetics. So in my lab, of course, studying a, a patient with a very, very severe muscle disease, we'd like to be able to take all of the variants that we find in her genome and look them up in everyone else who's ever been sequenced and ask a couple of different questions. You know, have they, have those, has that variant ever been seen before in anyone? If so, what is its frequency across different populations? And, and in the people that carry it, is there any evidence that there's some kind of disease risk in those individuals? For, for my colleagues who focus on very large case control studies of uh, common complex diseases like type 2 diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, what they're interested in is taking all of the variants that are discovered in their you know, five to 10,000 cases of a particular disease with exome sequencing data and comparing that to very large numbers of controls and determining which variants uh, differ in frequency between those, between, those two, um, between those two groups. So in other words, what are the variants that are causally associated with the risk of a particular disease?
So we, we live in a pretty remarkable time to be doing these kind of studies. So if we wanted to collect a huge amount of sequencing data on this side of the equation, these, these controls over on this side, there, ha there is an enormous amount of data that has been generated. So we, we know right now easily more than half a million people have had their exomes or genomes sequenced around the world. Um, in fact, that's certainly a lowball estimate. It's probably north of, of a million individuals have had at least some large scale sequencing data generated on them. So this is, this is an enormous amount of information that we, could, that we could use, at least in theory, to really deeply understand the properties of genetic variation across the human genome and in particular across protein coding genes that are sequenced by exomes. <laughs> but there are some pretty major challenges to getting access to those data. And in fact, the vast majority of those data are more or less completely inaccessible to, uh, to most geneticists. And some of these challenges are completely mundane. So it turns out, as I suspect many of you know, it's shockingly difficult to move large amounts of sequence data around. So we often have to resort to, uh, to very primitive methods like uh, actually moving the data onto, onto hard drives and then shipping them via FedEx to a, to a distant location, which is pretty depressing in the age of the internet. So that, that's, that's one trivial obstacle. But then there are a whole host of other obstacles. There are political obstacles to data sharing. Um, some academics don't like to share data. Some, some companies are not in a position where they can share data for, for commercial reasons. There are ethical obstacles. Many samples are not consented for broad data sharing, so it's impossible to actually get those, to ethically get those samples into large-scale databases. And then, and then another final challenge is the, uh, the challenge of ensuring that the data are consistently processed across projects. So right now around the world, basically every project doing large-scale sequencing with a handful of uh, honorable exceptions uses its own idiosyncratic pipeline for aligning the data, for processing the raw sequencing data, and for then performing variant calling. Um, so that means that if we were to take the final variant call sets from each of these different projects and naively try to munge them all together, what we would end up with is a data set that was dominated by technical variation between different calling pipelines rather than by interesting biological variation. So we face a real challenge in harmonizing the variants that we have across these uh, enormous data sets. So a few years ago, we set about trying to address that problem by pulling together all of the exome sequencing data that we had access to at the Broad. And I think the term exome will be familiar to everyone in the audience, but just in case, uh, an exome is basically a way of sequencing just the protein coding regions of the genome. And I'll, I'll use that pretty consistently throughout the talk. And a whole genome, of course, is looking at the whole, the whole genome as a whole. So, so in this case, over the, over the space of about a couple of years, we were able to assemble, uh, pull together the raw sequencing data on the Broad computational cluster for about 92,000 samples that had had their exome sequenced um, in various different places around the world. About 90% of these data had been sequenced at the Broad, about 10% in other locations. And it had all been sequenced as part of a wide variety of different, uh, of different sequencing projects. And I've, I've actually listed those here. So you can see here that the, the bulk of the samples that we pulled into this exome aggregation consortium, or EXAC, came from large case control studies of complex diseases, common complex diseases, with a lion's share coming from type 2 diabetes, from heart disease, particularly early onset myocardial infarction, um, from neuropsychiatric conditions such as schizophrenia and bipolar, and also from cancer. And I should emphasize here, we're including germline exomes from cancer patients, so blood exomes from cancer patients, not the tumors themselves. So this in theory represents germline variation across, across a large number of individuals. And then there's a long tail of other projects, um, including a, a pretty substantial number of cases who were ascertained on the basis of having severe Mendelian diseases as well. So we were able to, with, with some political wrangling that I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, we were able to pull all of these raw data together into one place uh, to push them through exactly the same reprocessing pipeline that I'll talk about very briefly in a, in a couple of slides time. And then to perform what we call joint variant calling, which basically means to assess every sample um, at, at each site in the genome, to assess every sample simultaneously, so that we could see whether or not a given, whether or not a variation is actually present at that particular site and then exactly which of the individuals carry that particular variation within the population, and to do that in a very harmonized way across all of the samples within the data set. So after, uh, after a massive informatics headache that I'll mention only briefly in a couple of slides time, we were able to generate a call set that spanned all 92,000 uh, exomes from this data set. And after that was complete, uh, we, we then threw away almost immediately about a third of the data, uh, and we, we resu which resulted in a subset of uh, just under 61,000 samples that we call our reference data set, and this is the public release of EXAC that many of you, I suspect, have used. And the reason we threw away a third of our samples was because either they were, uh, they, they didn't meet our, meet our very stringent quality threshold, so they, in some cases they didn't have sufficient coverage or they had uh, QC metrics that were, that were discordant with the rest of the data set. Uh, 
Um, we also threw away individuals who were related to anyone within the data set. So we have only uh, second degree relatives or uh, sorry, third degree relatives or, or uh, more distant within this data set. And we also removed anyone who didn't have consent for broad public data sharing of, of frequency data. And then finally, to the best of our ability, and this is important that this is not complete, but this was to the best of our ability, we removed samples where we knew that they had a severe pediatric disease. So in this, in this round, what we did is we removed anyone who had a severe Mendelian disease or who had autism, as well as their first degree relatives. So although this is by no means a data set that's free of disease, roughly half the people in this data set have some kind of adult onset complex disease, as best we can tell, it's free of, of individuals who have severe pediatric disease, um, or at least the frequency of those diseases is probably less than what we see in the general population. So th this uh, was an effort that we, we, of course, absolutely could not do on our own. We depended on the generosity of the sample providers. Um, all of these exomes were generated uh, using funding that was focused on, on disease-specific activities. So we're extremely lucky to have a great group of principal investigators who were not just willing to donate their data to the project, but actually really enthusiastic about making sure that the final data set was available to the wider biomedical community. Uh, the goal, of course, of this resource was to make something that we didn't just use internally, but that anyone, anyone could actually use. So we had a great group of principal investigators um, and also a, a large series of analysts um, who, who worked on the data. And I'll mention some of those uh, individuals as I, as I walk through the slides later. I did also just want to briefly mention the critical role that the Broad Institute genomics platform uh, played in this, uh, in this analysis. So as I mentioned, the Broad generated 90% of the exome sequencing data that went into XAC. In addition, they, they provided the pretty uh, brutal amounts of uh, storage and computing power that we needed to make this happen free of charge. So with, without the Broad Institute, we, we simply wouldn't have been able to do this analysis. So, so coming back to the actual requirements for doing this project, for those of you who like these kinds of numbers, um, here they are. For those of you who don't, I'll skim through this pretty rapidly. But basically what this plot shows is the, uh, the amount of raw data that was required at each of the different steps in the pipeline on this side, and then the amount of, kind of computing power that was required at each of those steps in the pipeline on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, so basically, our variant calling pipeline, which is pretty simple, vanilla GATK haplotype caller. Um, this is the same pipeline that any of you can, uh, can access using the GATK website. Um, of course, that pipeline was improved in, in collaboration with us over the course of this project. Basically, it has a number of different steps. Firstly, we take each individual exome and perform variant discovery within that individual exome. And that's a very computationally in intensive first step. Uh, and that produces a, a, a set of files called GBCFs. So what we end up starting with is about 1,000 uh, terabytes of raw sequence data. So that's about a petabyte of data, probably the equivalent of about 4,000 laptops of sequence data that we had to chase around the broad computational cluster to corral that all together into one place. And then with a, with a pretty hefty amount of compute, we were able to condense that down to a single set of variant calls, um, a VCF. Um, which uh, takes up about 3.3 terabytes of data for the, uh, to store all of the individual genotypes at all of the variable positions within the exact data set. So that's, that's, our, that's our final data set. Um, I should mention at this point the critical role that uh, Monkolek, a postdoc in my group, played in pulling this entire data set together. So Monkol actually was almost single-handedly responsible for chasing the data around on the disk, for figuring out exactly which samples should be kept or thrown away in the data set, and then for really making sure that the final data set was as clean as possible. So you performed all the quality control on the data set. So that's all I'm going to say about generating the exact data set. If anyone has any questions, by the way, feel free to interrupt me at, an, at any point. Um, I, I now want to sort of start getting into some of the scientific results that emerged from XAC, um, as well as the ways in which you can also access the data set. So the, the first thing we did when we'd finished calling across our 92,000 samples uh, was to produce a plot uh, like this. This is a principal component analysis. And basically, uh, this is, this is a, a basically a way of taking a, a large and complex genetic data set and reducing that down to the major axes of variation which in most human genetic data sets correspond to the, uh, the major axes of ge uh, geographical ancestry within the population. So in this plot, what you can see is a big ball of European samples at the top here. This will be a, a bit clearer on the next slide, actually, um, corresponding, in fact, to the majority of the samples in the data set. But you can also see pretty substantial numbers of samples, so thousands of samples corresponding to clusters from uh, African, particularly African-American samples, Latino, South Asian, and also East Asian samples. So this is by no means a, a global sampling of, of human genetic diversity, but it does give us pretty reasonable numbers of samples in many of the continental uh, groups that are uh, important for the, for the rare disease analyses that we're interested in doing. So here's a slightly more interpretable version of that plot. Um, here I'm comparing the exact data set uh, here with the two previous 
publicly available data sets of human genetic variation. So these are the Thousand Genomes Project and the NHLBI's Exome Sequencing Project, which many of us used, of course, as our default go-to reference databases for frequency variation uh, prior to EXAC. And the key point from this graph is that EXAC is bigger and it has lots of colors, and that basically just means that it, uh, it, that it has relatively large amounts of, of geographical diversity. So although we're still extremely European-centric, and that's, uh, uh, that's a consequence of the very opportunistic nature of this process, we didn't sequence these samples, we merely had access to samples that were sequenced for other purposes. We, we are still collecting uh, samples from many other populations around the world. Um, although, of course, this should really be a wake-up call that we need to start looking very heavily at building up reference data sets uh, in, in healthy individuals from undersampled populations, particularly the Middle East, for which we have currently almost no good uh, reference variation data. So at, at the end of this process, we had, a, we had assembled the, the largest uh, ever public catalog of uh, human protein coding genetic variants. So again, because we're only looking at exomes here, we have almost no power to look at non-coding regions of the genome, but we can go extremely deep within the protein coding regions. Um, we discover over 10 million genetic variants. Um, almost all of these are real based on our, our whole series of quality control metrics and validation studies that I'm not gonna go through here. Uh, that's about one variant every six base pairs, so it's an amazing resolution of variation within these coding regions. And the vast majority of these are rare and novel, and you can actually see that in this plot down here. So here on the x-axis, I'm plotting the, the frequency of uh, a particular class of variation. So here on the left-hand side, you can see variants that are seen only once in 60,000 people, so that's a frequency of about one in 100,000. In the second category, there are variants that are seen <laughs> more, more than once, but less than a frequency of one in 10,000 then there's everything else. And the blue segments are basically the variants that are seen in EXAC and have never been reported previously. So what this plot tells you, um, which should come as no surprise, I think, to anyone who's been following the literature for the last few years, is that the vast majority of variants that we discover in humans are extremely rare. Um, so in a data set of this size, the, more than half of them are seen only once, have a frequency of less than one in 100,000. And that any given large-scale sequencing study will discover a very substantial amount of, of novel variation that's never been seen previously. The, the goal of EXAC was to produce a data set that could be used by anyone. Um, so hopefully many of you have already used the EXAC website. Um, if not, if you go to exact.broadinstitute.org, you can, uh, you can uh, tap into all of the data that we've generated. The website, I should note, was built by Konrad Kachevsky, a, a postdoc in my lab, and a pretty heroic um, uh, series of a few weeks of coding. Uh, this is what you'll see if you look up your favorite gene in the EXAC browser. Uh, these, these blue columns here show you the coverage across each of the exons of, of a particular gene. So here we're basically squishing down the introns because we don't have any sequence coverage for those regions. And so you can see that, for instance, the first exon of PCSK9 is not very well covered, but many of the other exons within this, within this uh, gene are in fact well covered. And you can change that coverage threshold to, to whatever threshold you're interested in looking at. And then below that, you'll find a very long list typically of variants. And that basically consists of all of the variants that we discovered in all of our 61,000 samples. And then by clicking on those variants, you can learn more about their frequency across different populations and how confident we are that those variants are actually real. And that's provided for all of the 10 million variants within the, within the data set. And actually relatively recently, and I, I'm actually uh, particularly excited about this, we also made it possible for you to view the raw read support for, for a particular variant. So for about 95% of the variants in the exact data set, if you, click on, if you click on that variant link, what you'll see is a whole series of reads uh, piled up within that particular region. And this is taken from a representative sample of individuals who carry that particular variant. And that means for some of the more complex variants that you might be interested in looking at, you can see directly whether those reads actually support that the variant is, is, is present, which of course is extremely important for complex variants or insertions and deletions where the variant calling process is, uh, is not necessarily ideal. So that's, that's available. Um, and if you have a particular variant that you, uh, that you suspect is not real, um, we'd be very interested in you emailing us so we can, we're actually keeping track of those so we can improve the variant calling in, uh, in future rounds. So just briefly before I move on to the science, the, um, we've been really gratified by how widely the EXAC data set has been used, um, particularly by the clinical genomics community. So we've, it's been out now for about 15 months and I actually just looked up this morning and, and sometime a couple of weeks ago we hit our 3 million page views. This has been incredibly widely used. Uh, here you can see the daily usage um, over, over those 15 months. We can learn a lot actually about the activity cycles of genomicists around the world by looking at this data set. So we know that, uh, we know that uh, genomicists or at least clinical geneticists really don't work at all on weekends. So Saturday and Sunday are complete dead zones. Although they do work on weekends slightly more in America compared to Europe, which is very gratifying to my American colleagues, of course. And, and it's, also, it's also interesting that in uh, the, the holiday period, so the Christmas period, both in here and, and over here, 
is a markedly lower activity, although it appears that in our, our latest Christmas period, the activity is much higher than the first Christmas period. So people are learning as they start to use the exact data set that they can now, they can now use it. They are using it much more actively over Christmas than they were a year ago, which is, which is great. So in addition to viewing data through the website itself, people can also download freely actually the entire VCF, uh, the entire data set that consists of information about every single variant within that data set. We can't release the individual level genotypes for all of our 60,000 samples, but you can release the next best thing, which is basically frequency and all sorts of other information across each, each of those variants. And that data set's been, generated, uh, been downloaded rather over 2,000 times um, from over five, 500 organizations, actually many times by the same organization more than once. So Baylor College of Medicine, for instance, has downloaded it more than 25 times independently. So they have the, the same data set living separately on their, on their cluster. Um, I actually haven't looked, I should have looked up the data, the, uh, data for you guys, but I have no idea how many times it's been downloaded here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk going through some of the different ways in which the exact data set can be used to understand the properties of variation in the human exome, and particularly in their application to uh, rare disease analysis, um, which of course has, has been my, my lab's major focus of interest. Um, but there are, there are many ways to use this data set. So in particular, I'll talk relatively briefly about um, how uh, exact benefits the filtering of candidate pathogenic variants, both within a given disease patient as well as within data, data sets of allegedly uh, pathogenic variants. Um, I'll spend a fair bit of time talking about a single, uh, a single gene example of how we can use large case data sets as well as exact to understand the penetrance of variants uh, in a particular gene, a particular dominant gene. And, and finally, assuming I have time, I'll talk through some of the ways in which we can identify genes and regions of genes that have been subject to very strong uh, functional constraint. And, so and how we can use that to identify regions where a given variant that's discovered in a disease patient is actually far more likely to be disease causing. Before I get into that, I, I did just want to mention that if you're interested in any the details of almost any of the science that I'll be presenting today, we've actually made the manuscript um, of the paper uh, freely publicly available, so you can download it from BioArchive. Actually, the easiest way to find it is if you just Google BioArchive Lec. Uh, Lec, uh, Morka Lec is the first author. You'll be able to, you'll be able to track that down. Um, and so most of the, a, a pretty detailed description of many of the analyses that I'll be describing today is made available there. And that should be coming out uh, in formal print in, in the next, within the next few months. OK, so let me start by talking about ways in which we can use XAC to evaluate the pathogenicity of particular variants, so specifically using the frequency of variants that we discover in XAC to determine whether or not they're likely to be, to, to be disease causing. And the, the first and very simple thing, of course, we can do is, is simply to ask, in a, in a given exome, how, how many variants are present in that exome that exceed some frequency threshold, where we believe that that frequency threshold is, uh, is the, the threshold that, that determines whether or not a variant is plausibly associated with disease. So that was actually incredibly clumsily worded. Let me, let me try that again. So in, in, a, in a case where there's a dominant, where we're looking at a patient who has a, a dominant disease, we can almost certainly apply a fairly stringent frequency threshold as to how common the causal variant could be within the population. So let's say for a, for a dominant disease where the, the prevalence of that disease is, is much less than one in a thousand, we could pretty easily set a threshold of one in a thousand uh, frequency for any variant to be a, a plausible candidate for causing that particular disease. So that's exactly what we've done here. Uh, here what we've done is to take, and this is work that was done by Eric Minikel in my group, We've taken 100 individuals from five different continental populations, and these are actually subsetted out of EXAC and then removed from the EXAC data set. And for each of those uh, five populations, for each of those five sets of 100 individuals, we've asked, when we apply a frequency filter of one in 1,000, how many variants are left behind in their exome? This is a confident frequency filter of one in 1,000. And here we're comparing two different uh, exome data sets. The previous publicly available exome data set, the ESP data set, which had 6,500 exomes, and then XAC, which has uh, 61,000 exomes, so nearly, nearly 10 times as many exomes. What you can see here is that the number of variants that remain in a given exome after applying this filter goes down precipitously when we start using the XAC data set. And that, that increase in power comes from two different, uh, for, for two different reasons. The first, of course, is simply that XAC is much larger, which is great. So we have uh, more, more, much more confidence in determining a frequency of one in a thousand. And the second reason is that XAC is much more diverse. So for instance, it includes East Asians and South Asian samples, which means that we're much more likely to be able to filter out variants that are discovered in those particular populations. So there's no question here that bigger is better and more diverse is better uh, in, in removing uh, these, these candidate variants from, uh, from our rare disease patient exomes. The, the second thing we can do with XAC is to look at variants that have previously been reported as being disease causing. And we've actually spent quite a bit of time doing this. I'm not going to go through all the analyses. I'll just go through, I guess, one of the most obvious ones, 
which is to take the variants that were reported, had previously been re reported in at least one database of disease-causing mutation, either HGMD or ClinVar, and then look for variants that are, have an implausibly high frequency in at least one population. And so here we set a, a, f a fairly uh, conservative threshold of 1% frequency. And in, in this analysis, which was led by Anne O'Donnell-Luria and Eric, Eric Minikel also contributed, what, what we basically then did was, what Anne did rather, was to then manually curate the evidence that each of those variants is, is actually disease causing. And what we found should come as no surprise to anyone here, it, it turns out that if you focus on variants with a frequency of over 1% in at least one population, the vast majority of these turn out to be errors in the literature. Um, so the situations where the evidence for a variant actually being pathogenic is incredibly weak and where we can be pretty confident that the, the assertion of causality was actually a false positive in the original literature. That's the purple section here. We also have a, a, a bunch of variants that are actually database errors, where for instance, the database has slurped up a long table of variants in a, in a supplementary file and assigned all of them as being pathogenic, when in fact some of those were actually originally ascertained as benign. And then there's a whole host of other things that happen with these variants, with only a very tiny fraction of these actually being confidently disease causing. And of course, given that they're greater than 1% frequency, typically associated with a relatively mild form of the disease. Uh, just to give you one spectacularly egregious example of errors in the literature, uh, this, is a, this is a case where a, a V2A mutation in, a, in an unpronounceable gene uh, was, had been associated in a paper that was published in 2014 with severe hearing loss as well as a renal phenotype in a, in a, in a Turkish consanguineous family. The, uh, in the abstract it says very clearly that this a variant had been determined to be causal in their particular analysis. So they say that this is uh, the first report describing a Turkish girl with this particular disease caused by this V2A mutation in this particular gene. Um, our notes on this particular variant note that despite that this is homozygous in a single consanguineous child, the parents were never sequenced nor were any controls, and the authors fail to note the variant has an allele frequency of 70% in 1,000 genomes, which is a remarkably high frequency. So we can, so uh, 1,000 genomes, it should be noted by that, at that time had been around for four years. There was absolutely no excuse for not looking this up. And, and this is, of course, a frequency that's uh, outrageously higher than you could ever expect for a recessive disease. So this is, uh, this is one, perhaps the worst published example that we, to our knowledge, of, um, of a, a false positive in literature. But of course, there are many other more subtle examples. And one of the things that comes up as you start digging through these false positives is how difficult it actually is sometimes to make causal assertions about variants. And again, many people here will already be well aware of that and how much we benefit simply from being able to say across all of these populations, these are the variants that we can rule out as being causal and actually often re removes a very large fraction of, of candidate variants from a particular genome. So then moving on, an, another thing we can do with uh, large scale reference databases of variation is, is figure out not only whether a variant is actually pathogenic, so in other words, whether it's, it actually has some causal role in a disease, but how penetrant it is. In other words, how likely it is that a person who carries that particular variant will actually suffer from, from that disease. Uh, and this is work that's been led by Eric Minikel, and here we've, I'm gonna focus on one disease gene, uh, the PRNP gene, which is associated with a series of adult onset um, prion diseases. So it's, it's worth taking a step back to consider penetrance. So again, that is the probability that someone who carries a particular variant will actually, or, or genotype will actually have that, that disease. Uh, one, one of the most striking and, and perhaps surprising findings from analysis of the exact data set is the sheer number of previously reported severe dominant disease mutations that we discover in our, in our samples. So again, to the best of our knowledge, we've ascertained these people against having severe pediatric disease. So we, cer we certainly shouldn't have very large numbers of, of very severe Mendelian disease in our data set. And yet almost everyone within this data set carries, uh, carries actually more than one, so often at least a handful of severe, uh, previously reported severe dominant disease mutations. There are many possible explanations for these. Uh, in in a, a handful of cases, it's possible that these mutations do actually, do actually cause disease, which is either undiagnosed or just hasn't, uh, hasn't wreaked onset in that particular uh, individual in exact yet. Uh, so for instance, for a late onset disease, that's, that's entirely plausible. Um, a much more likely, from a Bayesian perspective, a much more likely explanation for many of these variants is that they're actually a false positive. <coughs> So they don't actually cause disease and they, they've just popped up in the exact data set by chance. But then we do also find some more exotic explanations. So in, in a, actually a, a, a pretty substantial number of genes, we find evidence that there are in fact uh, variants that are present in that particular gene in the exact population, but they're clearly somatic mosaic. So they're present with an allele balance of less than 50%. And these are often genes that are simultaneously, where we know that germline mutations cause severe dominant developmental phenotypes but where somatic mutations are associated with a cancer phenotype. So in many of these cases, we expect that this represents a case where 
a, a clone of cells carrying those particular mutations has actually risen up to some frequency within the blood of these individuals, and that's why those variants are present. But because they're not present in germline tissue, that they're not uh, able to cause a developmental disease in, in those individuals. And then, and then a final explanation is some variation within the population in the expressivity or the penetrance of, of a particular disease. So in other words, uh, the, the way in which a disease manifests itself in carriers. So we had to figure out how we could actually untangle these, uh, these different explanations. And so here we turned to a, a particular gene where we could go extremely deep uh, in, into addressing each of these different issues. The, the gene that we chose for a variety of reasons was PRNP. PRNP includes, encodes the prion protein, um, which is, I think, very well known to many people here in this audience because of its notorious association with uh, acquired forms of severe prion disease, like variant creutzfeldt jakob disease. Um, which of, co of course can be acquired by eating contaminated beef, uh, beef contaminated by uh, poorly folded prion, uh, prions. But in addition to that, there are also a number of uh, clear dominant genetic causes of prion disease. Uh, these are extremely rare. They have an annual incidence of about one in, one in a million, a lifetime risk of about one in 10,000. Um, most of the cases are sporadic. We have absolutely no idea what causes them. Again, that notorious 1% of cases are acquired through some kind of infectious origin. But then 15% of prion disease cases are uh, genetic, clearly genetic, and they are caused in every case, as far as we can tell, by a dominant negative, a dominant gain of function mutations within the PRNP gene that increase the risk of misfolding and therefore increase the risk of, of these diseases. These diseases typically have their age of onset in the 50s, so they're late onset, but they are extremely swift. So from uh, first age of onset of symptoms to death uh, often takes only a year. The, one of, the, one of the reasons why we decided to study PRNP is that there's amazing surveillance data for these, uh, for these, these diseases. So nearly all diagnosed cases in first world countries are ascertained because of the risk of an infectious origin for these diseases. And in almost all of those cases, the PRNP gene is actually sequenced. So we have a really uh, fantastic assessment of the, free, of the frequency spectrum of variants within this gene uh, in cases who actually do suffer from those particular diseases that we can use to learn more about uh, the, uh, their penetrance. So we can, so using a set of assumptions, which I will just argue here for the sake of argument are sensible, and I'm not gonna go through them all one by one. We can actually calculate how many variant, how many individuals we would expect to see within the exec data set who do actually carry a severe dominant uh, mutation within the PRNP gene. And it turns out that number is about 0.5. So what that means is that either zero or one individual within our 60,000 samples should actually carry a, a PRNP mutation that will uh, eventually kill them from a severe neurodegenerative prion disease. So that's the expected number. Uh, the observed number uh, is, turns out to be shockingly higher. So it's, uh, it's actually 100 times higher, and it's distributed across 12 different mutations, all of which have previously been reported to be uh, strongly associated with prion disease. Um, and you, and the, the size of this number is, of, is of course, uh, extremely worrying. Um, it, it, could, it could come for a, from a few different possible explanations, the most disturbing of which could be that genetic prion disease is actually far more common than we, uh, than we think. Now, if we, if, we believe those, if we took those numbers at face value, that would imply that prion disease is actually 100 times more common than we think it is, which is, which is impossible. So there's just no way that that load of disease could exist in the population without that being diagnosed. Although it is possible that there is some level of underdiagnosis and some level of misdiagnosis within the population, that clearly can't explain the full scope of the excess of uh, variants discovered in, in the exact populations. So the most likely explanation here is that mutations are, uh, at least some of the mutations within this data set, are actually less pathogenic than we think. Um, and those could, in some cases, be completely false positive associations, so that they've never been associated with prion disease. And in some cases, those could be due to incomplete penetrance, so a variant that does influence disease risk, but doesn't cause disease in everyone who actually carries it. Um, and that's been speculated about in the prion disease literature, but we've never had a data set large enough to actually uh, distinguish between these, uh, these different categories. So what we can now do is a, very simple, uh, is a very simple comparison of the frequency of variants identified in cases versus controls. And for this study, we were able to take, uh, Eric Minical actually, uh, through sheer force of will, was able to assemble a, a case series of 16,000 cases affected by prion disease, where for most of those individuals, we actually had sequencing data from the PRNP gene. So this is by far and away the largest collection of cases for this disease that have ever been assembled. Um, we were also able to compare that to two different data sets. We could compare it to the exact data set for, for every variant that, that could be observed, so that's 60,000 controls. We are also able to work with 23andMe to look at 12 of these mutations, the, some of the more common mutations causing, uh, reported to cause prion disease, in over 500,000 people from their database as well. 
Um, in, both in XAC and in 23andMe, we typically don't know whether or not someone uh, will end up to go on to suffer from prion disease or whether or not they have a family history of that disease. But we can use them uh, to inform our population prior that a, that a given variant is, is actually causal. So in the case of uh, comparing our prion cases versus XAC, we can make this very simple plot. It basically just shows the, the frequency, each of these dots here is a variant, and here we have the frequency on, of the, that variant in cases on the x-axis, so in disease cases, and then in x-ac on the y-axis, so that is more or less population controls. And we can broadly divide these variants into three different categories. So along the x-axis here, you can see uh, variants that are present only in cases, uh, often at, at quite high frequencies, and these almost all turn out to be variants where we have very strong evidence that these are actually pathogenic. So often there's a mouse model that's been made, as well as uh, many cases of a variant segregating uh, well in large pedigrees. So for all of those variants, we see them pretty much exactly where we'd expect to see them, and that is just along that, that x-axis there. They're never present in, in controls, and they are present in cases. Along the y-axis, we have a very different category of variants. Uh, these are variants that are common in controls and rarely seen in cases, or at least are seen in cases at a frequency that's consistent with, the, with them actually being completely benign. So although we don't have statistical power for some of these variants, for at least the variants up in this top left-hand corner, we can be very confident these actually don't have any effect on prion disease, or at least it's an it's a immeasurably small effect on prion disease. So these are, these are, many of these variants already had some question marks around them in the, li in the literature, but here we can definitively rule these out as being disease-causing. And then we have an interesting cluster of variants in the middle here, which are too common in cases to be completely benign, but also far too common in controls to be fully pathogenic. If they were fully pathogenic, 100% penetrant, then the burden of prion disease in the population would be far higher than what we actually see. And in fact, we can actually calculate the lifetime risk of prion disease that's, that's uh, conferred by each of these different mutations. That turns out to vary pretty substantially. For this variant up the top here, it clearly is associated with prion disease risk, but it confers a lifetime risk of severe prion disease of less than one in a thousand. So that has very severe, obviously ma major implications for genetic counseling for that particular variant. For V210i uh, down here, there's, a, there's a, a lifetime risk of somewhere between one and 10%. So this is still a fairly substantial contributor to lifetime risk of prion disease, but again, is not fully, uh, fully penetrant. So this uh, is one of the first cases where we've been able to really put pretty precise error bars around the probability that a given disease in a, a given <laughs> severe dominant disease mutation will actually cause disease. We've been able to demonstrate that there are actually these incompletely penetrant variants that exist within the population. And of course, this has, has major implications for genetic counseling and can be expanded fairly readily to any other disease where we have large series of cases, preferably sequenced cases, um, from individuals who actually carry that particular disease. So I think this is, this is a starting point for a much, larger, uh, a much larger series of analyses that need to be done across many dominant diseases to really understand exactly, how we, exactly what the penetrance is for all of the reported variants uh, for each of those diseases. Okay, so the, the final uh, piece of science that I wanted to talk about today was the ways in which we can use the exec data set, not, not just to study the variants that are present within the human population, but also the variants that are missing from the population. And in, in particular, thinking about ways in which we can use that missing variation to identify regions of the genome, or the exome in this case, which is subject to very strong functional constraint. So this is, uh, this is work that has been led by Caitlin Samoka an amazing graduate student in Mark Daly's lab who's been working with my lab for the, um, on, the, on the exact data set. What, what Caitlin did was first to define a very clear expectation as to how many variants of a particular functional class we would expect to see in each gene in the genome in 60,000 people. So you can, you can imagine this basically as saying, in a world in which the only force that determines the number of variants that arise within a particular gene is mutation, how many such variants should we see in, in 60,000 people? And that's determined using a fairly simple mutational model that basically just takes for a particular site and the two bases on either side of that site and determines how likely, uh, use, using a mutation rate table that's been calculated using independent genomic data, we can determine how likely each of those mutations, each of those sites is to mutate into each of the three other uh, possible uh, bases at that, uh, at that particular site. So we, once we have that mutation rate table, we can, we can also calculate for each of those uh, groups of three for, sorry, for each of the three possible substitutions at that particular site, what would the functional impact of that be? So would it create a, a silent mutation? Would it create a, a missense mutation or a nonsense mutation? And then, and then you use it by multiplying together those two different properties, we can, we can get for each gene under a random mutational model, the probability of seeing a synonymous mutation, the probability of seeing a missense mutation, the probability of seeing a nonsense or splice site mutation that would be expected to severely disrupt the function of that gene. 
and then by uh, calibrating that data set, we can, we can come up with a expected number of each of those given variants in six, across 60,000 people. Uh, I should also mention very briefly, this is also corrected for the confounders that you might expect. Um, in particular, sequencing depth turns out to be extremely important to take into account here. So we have a, um, a model that, uh, that, is, that basically reduces our power in regions where we have low sequencing depth. So the, the importance of this model uh, is that what it means is it gives us a very clear expectation in, in a situation where this gene has absolutely no uh, purifying selection acting on it. So nothing in a, in a situation where the gene actually does nothing in the human population, we know exactly how many variants we would expect to see in that gene. We can now look to see how many of those variants are missing and that tells us how, how strongly natural selection is actually acting on that class of variants. So here uh, you can see actually for synonymous variation, the, the uh, correlation between Caitlin's model on the x-axis so this is the expected number of variants. Every gene here is a gray dot. And on the y-axis, we have the observed variation within 60,000 samples. And you can see here that for silent variation, where we expect most of the variants are actually completely benign, the fit is exquisitely good. So we have an R squared of about 0.96. So Caitlin's model does an extremely good job of predicting uh, for each gene, in the, for, for, for predicting the number of such variants we would expect to see in each gene in the genome. But then for missense mutations and much more strikingly for loss of function mutations, so these are mutations that are expected to cause truncation of a protein, you can see that the fit becomes much less good and that's exactly as we would expect. Um, this, is, this is not a surprise at all. All that it tells us is that for most genes in the human genome, loss of function mutations are not tolerated. They tend to be removed from the population by natural selection and therefore we see less of them than we would expect to see by chance. So again, that's, that's no surprise at all. What's cool about this data set though is that with 60,000 people, for the first time, we can actually put a number on that. So we can actually say how many nonsense variants are missing from a particular gene compared to what we would expect to see by chance. So let me illustrate that with two examples. This is a gene where we absolutely know that, uh, that heterozygous uh, missense and loss of function mutations in the gene cause uh, very severe neurodevelopmental phenotypes. There's a gene called DINK1H1. And you can see that Caitlin's model predicts almost exactly the number of synonymous mutations we would expect to see by chance. Um, so the, the predicts almost precisely the number of variants that we do actually observe in this, in this particular data set. But for both missense mutations and, for loss of, and most strikingly for loss of function mutations, there is a huge depletion of these variants within the gene. And for the loss of function variants that we do observe, these are, these are clustered towards the end of the gene and in alternatively spliced exons, so they're probably not actually loss of function. So the pattern of variation within this gene is, is clearly consistent with the fact that both missense and loss of function variants are being purged from this gene by natural selection, and we can actually estimate how strong that effect is. So that's for a gene where we know what the, the human phenotype is, and of course we can apply this to any gene in the genome. Here's, here's an example where we actually really don't know what uh, the heterozygous LOF mutations in this gene actually do. It's a gene called UBR5, where pretty much all we know is that it's somehow involved in the ubiquitin system, and that if we knock it out in mice, uh, they die during embryogenesis. And in this case, we can see a pretty similar picture to, uh, to DINK1H1. A, a, a more modest suppression of missense mutations, but a very, very striking suppression of loss of function mutations. So basically all, almost all of the LOF mutations within this particular gene are removed from the population by natural selection. The one remainder we think is, again, probably not a genuine loss of function mutation. And that tells us that although we don't know what phenotype is caused by loss of function mutations in this gene, there certainly is one. So there is something out there, there is a disease out there that is actually caused by loss of function mutations in this gene, we just haven't found it yet. So we can actually, we can put some numbers on this by assuming that genes fall into, broadly, fall into one of three different categories. Either there are genes that have no effect of selection on loss of function variants, and we call this our null category. There are some genes, of course, where loss of function mutations do have an effect on phenotype, but in a recessive format. Uh, and these tend to, in our data set, these tend to show about a 50% reduction in loss of function variants compared to expectations. And then we have fully haploinsufficient uh, disease genes where uh, any loss of function mutation results in a severe disease phenotype. And in our data set, because there's some noise about the loss of function variants, we see somewhere less than 10% of the expected number of LOF variants. And this, uh, this haploinsufficiency score, we can use a, an expectation maximization approach to come up with a score called PLI that tells us how likely a gene is to fall into that uh, very severe haploinsufficient category on the right-hand side there. And once we do that, we find patterns that make uh, perfect sense if we, if we look at the clustering of known genes in the genome. So we can see that genes that are known to cause severe haploinsufficient disease genes almost all fall within this high PLI uh, category. So uh, that's this, this setup here. Genes that are haploinsufficient but cause more moderate or, or mild phenotypes show, uh, sh still show some enrichment but a much more modest enrichment. Uh, essential and dominant disease genes are still more enriched than the, the average and then recessive disease genes are slightly depleted from this, uh, from this high 
a PLI category, which is consistent with them, of course, um, mostly being recessive and falling into another category. So this set of about 3,000 disease genes that is a strikingly depleted for loss of function variation is incredibly enriched for known disease genes, exactly as we would expect. But what's interesting about this category of, of 3,000 genes is that more than 80% of them have actually have absolutely no known human phenotype. So again, we can be very confident that something, loss of function mutations in these genes really do have some impact on phenotype. We just, we just have absolutely no idea what that, what that impact is. And it is worth noting that although these genes are very severely depleted for loss of function mutations, that doesn't necessarily mean that the phenotype that they have is severe. Um, it, it almost certainly just means that the phenotype that they have is observed in a heterozygous state, and that it has some strong selection coefficient, it has some selection coefficient acting on it. So this could be relatively mild or it could be incredibly severe. And there's a, there's a lot more work I think we need to do to, to, to put uh, genes into different categories. What it does tell us though is that if we find a de novo loss of function mutation in one of these genes in a disease patient, we have an incredibly strong prior that, 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 that is actually a, a causal variant within their particular disease. And this is true not just in Mendelian disease, but also in complex disease as well. So very briefly, this is analysis that's been done in looking at de novo mutations in a, in a very large collection of um, a case control study of schizophrenia. Uh, sorry, this is, uh, these are looking at rare mutations, so singleton mutations in a case control study of schizophrenia, where we know that in this, co in this cohort as a whole, there is a, a very modest enrichment of rare loss of function variants in cases compared to controls. So it's, it's clearly there, but the signal is incredibly weak. If we restrict that signal to genes that we call haploinsufficient, so genes with a very high uh, PLI score, and then, and then put the rest of the genes, so the other 16,500 16 genes into the, uh, the, the uh, non-haploinsufficient category, what we find is that basically all of the signal in schizophrenia for these rare loss of function mutations is found within these haploinsufficient genes. So we have zoomed in on a collection of genes where almost all the signal is in terms of loss of function, rare loss of function variants that are actually associated with this, with this relatively severe neuropsychiatric disease. So this class of genes we think will be an extremely powerful class of genes to go after um, across a whole range of different uh, disease phenotypes. The other, the other cool thing we can do with 60,000 people is not only look at gene level analysis, but also think about uh, regional level analysis. So identifying particular regions of genes that are under strong missense constraint. Um, because of course we know that not, not all regions of gene are created equal. Many of those will be under very strong missense constraint and some of those uh, missense mutations will be allowed to arise without any selective penalty. So Caitlin has developed a method to do this and basically very briefly what that method does is to divide a gene up into chunks where each of those chunks contains some differing level of missense constraint. So we could find for instance that, that a particular heart, that a half of a gene is completely unconstrained. There's exactly as many missense mutations as we would expect to see by chance. And then another half of a gene is highly constrained. So it may, we may see a much lower level of missense mutations. And what that means is that missense mutations that arise in our patients in this, in this half of the gene over here are likely to be much more interesting to us than ones that are found in the other half. Just to give you a couple of quick examples, we can show that for some genes, there is absolutely no evidence of heterogeneity across that, across that gene. So here in SCN1A, a large voltage channel gene, we find, we find that there is very strong depletion of missense mutations, but they occur across the entire gene. So there's no particular domain where mutations cluster. And that's consistent with the fact that mutations are actually found all, all of the way across this gene. There's actually no striking enrichment in any particular domain for mutations in this gene. In, in contrast, in KCNQ4, which is associated with deafness, we identify two regions of constraint, one at the beginning, where we know that most of the mutations in the disease are in deafness are actually found, an unconstrained region in the middle, which has effectively no mutations associated with deafness, and then, and then a third region of, of, of pretty strong constraint at the tail end of the gene, where we have actually no idea what um, mutations in this region necessarily do. So there's a lot, lot more work to be done here to actually figure out whether the mutations in this gene are associated with a different form of deafness, or perhaps cause some, uh, some different disease entirely. But it's almost certainly the case that uh, heterozygous missense mutations in that region of the gene do have some uh, relatively severe phenotype. So uh, that's all I'm going to say about science. I just wanted to mention, to reiterate again, um, the commitment of this project to making the data fully publicly available. So we've made all our frequency data available. Uh, you can also download from the exac.broadinstitute.org um, website all of the gene level missense and loss of function constraint data and the regional constraint uh, work that I just mentioned uh, very briefly in the last few slides, you'll also be able to download the exact regions of the genes where we find evidence for uh, very severe missense level constraint as well. That should be coming out within the next couple of weeks. So we, ha we obviously have a lot of work to do in EXAC and the plan is now to continue to expand and improve this resource and we're also very interested in getting feedback from you guys as to how we can make it better. A couple of things that are coming in the next year. Um, firstly, EXAC V2 will be coming out. So this is a brand new call set.
Uh, we're hoping here to incorporate, um, this, this will actually depend on how long it takes us to get all this data together, but we'll have somewhere between 100,000 and 150,000 uh, exomes in the, in the public release. So this should uh, actually very substantially increase our ability to interrogate variants down to extremely low frequencies within the general population. And we'll also add uh, a bunch of new populations, including Ashkenazi Jewish uh, populations in that release. This, the second thing we're very interested in doing is moving to whole genome data, of course, so that we have a whole genome reference data set that those of us doing whole genome sequencing in our rare disease patients can use. Uh, we've completed a test run on, on three and a half thousand genomes, and the goal over the next six months is to amp that up to about somewhere between 15 and 20,000 genomes that we'll be able to release under, under the same terms of agreement as the exact data set. So that will give us at least uh, some frequency information in the non-coding regions of the genome. Uh, we'll be able to share the age, share ages in a very limited way. So every, every variant in the genome, in the exome rather, you'll be able to look up the distribution of ages for the individuals who carry that particular variant. So that could well be useful in the case of a, an alleged dominant disease variant. If you see, for instance, that all of the individuals who carry that in exac are before the age of onset of that particular disease. And we're working pretty actively now on figuring out a way of doing genotype-based recall. So be, being able to take interesting variants that pop up within the exec data set, uh, look, those, look those up within the data set, and potentially get more phenotype data from the individuals who carry those variants. So we can, we can determine, for instance, whether they have a particular uh, interesting dominant disease that shows up in, uh, in another study. I should say, though, that given that this is an opportunistic cohort, that's, uh, that's only going to apply to a relatively small fraction of the samples. We think maybe a quarter to a third of the samples uh, this may be possible for. So that's it. Some, some of the key points, hopefully, that I came across in this talk. Firstly, uh, it's useful to pull together large amounts of genetic variation data. This, I, I don't think, is going to be a big shock to this audience. Um, but I, I've actually been surprised at how many different ways we've been able to find uses for the exact data set. Um, this was originally conceived simply as a frequency filtering data set for rare disease, but it's turned out to, to have value in a whole, on a whole range of different disease areas. I, I did want to emphasize the critical importance of, of sharing of raw data. So we would never have been able to pull together this data set if, we were, if it weren't for a set of investigators that was willing to make the raw data from their samples uh, fully available and to put that through the same pipeline so that we could be confident that the variant calls that we made were actually perfectly harmonized with, with other data sets. And that, that's been extremely important for the interpretation of the variants in this, uh, in this project. It, uh, again, no surprise to most of the people in this audience, but we need to be extremely careful about how we interpret the variants that we discover in, in rare, uh, the rare variants that we discover in our, in our patient exomes. Many of these, will, of course, will be completely benign. And any individual that you look at in exac contains many hundreds of variants that you could tell a story about potentially being disease causing. Uh, having large scale reference data sets of variation really helps to, to filter those variants out. Uh, and it also helps us to estimate uh, two critical parameters, so the penetrance of a particular variant as we start to build up large case series, and also the constraint, so how likely it is that a given type of variant in a particular region of the gene uh, is, is to actually cause disease. And, and those, uh, both of those uh, properties will really start to improve as we increase our sample size. So as we move to 150,000 samples, I expect we'll get much better estimates both of penetrance and also be able to zoom in on much smaller regions of the genome where we can uh, be very confident that uh, missense and, and loss of function mutations actually do cause disease. And with that, I'll finish by thanking uh, the people in my lab who've been working on, on this project, particularly Monkul, uh, Eric, and Conrad, who I've mentioned, um, as well as Caitlin Smoka, who I also mentioned was uh, worked in this from Mark Daly's lab, all of the exact pr principal investigators who allowed their data to be used uh, in, this, in this project, and everyone who helped to work on developing the systems to make this work. And then finally, once again, uh, the broad genomics and data sciences platform that were absolutely critical uh, in, in uh, providing the storage, compute, and the data uh, to make this project possible. And thank you to you guys for listening.